We're live, Honourable Dear. Thank you and welcome to the Global Young MP Initiative 2022 uh, with the topic of innovation to eliminate learning poverty. And this is hosted by the World Bank. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to moderate today. My name is Diarro Esti. I'm an MP from Indonesia. I am here joined by delegates from Indonesia as well. Uh, the Vice Chair of the Interparliamentary Cooperation, Honorable Gilang, and also fellow members of the Interparliamentary Cooperation of the Indonesian Parliament, Honorable Iren, and also Honorable Putri. And uh, I'd like to extend my warm welcome to all of you joining. I know some of you are in different parts of the world. Uh, we have some in, uh, you know, across the world, really, uh, middle in Middle East countries, in Asia, in Europe, in America. And it's wonderful to be uh, able to gather in today's very important discussion. Many of the world's development challenges um, are happening currently from gaps in education and nutrition to climate change to unemployment. And this is affecting young people in general. Young MPs are more likely to understand the perspective of younger generations and to approach the issues affecting them with enthusiasm, uh, creativity, and technological uh, know-how. The, the Global Young MP Initiative uh, was launched this is a background for everybody in 2019 as a knowledge sharing and advocacy platform to strengthen the voices of young legislators on these crucial development challenges. And with relevance to our topic today, you know, in terms of the education sector, and especially now, given that we are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are facing numerous challenges. I recently uh, read as well, actually from the World Bank, uh, a paper on the impact of COVID-19, on the impact of COVID-19 on education. And this has, uh, you know, resulted in school closures in various parts of the world. And, you know, at the peak of the pandemic, 45 countries in Europe and Central Asia region closed their schools. This has affected 185 million students. Countries in Asia uh, and in Indonesia as well has faced similar issues. And this has, you know, played a constraint in terms of the access of tech, uh, access of education in general. And so today's discussion. Um, we hope that we can learn more about how technology and how innovation, you know, brings about and uh, plays its role in terms of disseminating information to those uh, who are in need of uh, resources and educational means. And so I'm very delighted that to begin with today, we will have um, several speeches from the World Bank and also honorable members of parliament across the world. I am very grateful to have all of you on one screen, even though we're on different parts of the world, but I know that we all have the same uh, you know, enthusiasm in creating a better world for all, particularly in the educational sector. And now I would like to um, give the floor to uh, Sheila Redzepi, the Vice President of External and Corporate Relations. Sheila leads the World Bank's group's efforts to build strategic relationships with foundations, philanthropists, parliamentarians, civil society, and other key partners in support of the World Bank group's mission to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. Her role is very significant and is very important for all of us. And so I'm very, very honored to present the floor to Mrs. Sheila. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Honorable Dia, for hosting, and a warm welcome to all the legislator legislators who are joining um, you today as well from Indonesia, and a warm welcome to everyone else uh, to this third um, meeting of the Young Global uh, Members of Parliament Initiative. I'm absolutely delighted to connect uh, today with so many influential young legislators we are coming together uh, today against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine, which is taking a, a massive human, social, and economic toll and causing spillovers into neighboring countries uh, that are creating ripple effects around the world, uh, including uh, food price spikes and energy shocks. For example, just yesterday, the, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the World Food Program, and the World Trade Organization called for urgent and coordinated action on food security. 
And sadly, we are also seeing fragility, conflict, and violence across the world in uh, several countries, something you're, uh, many of you will be all too familiar with. As Honorable Dia mentioned, these setbacks also come at a time when most countries are still reeling from the reversals in development that are, were inflicted by COVID-19, uh, with uh, uh, almost 100 million people uh, pushed into extreme poverty and inequalities that were made worse um, uh, by losses in education. We'll hear about that from, from Jaime today and health, uh, nutrition, and of course, uh, gender equality. It's this unprecedented uh, situation that you know, prompts us all to think somewhat differently about the nature of the nature of uh, the scale of and the speed of the response to these overlapping crises, and keep on keeping, of course, our focus on the uh, longer-term development issues that affect us all. But of course, you you know uh, these challenges very well. You've been on the front lines of the response uh, to these crises. Uh, you're holding extraordinary sessions, implementing exceptional measures. Uh, approving emergency budgets, overseeing your government uh, uh, to shape policies, innovations, and reforms that are needed to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people, both um, at home in your countries, but also uh, abroad. And on that note, I really want to acknowledge everyone's support uh, for the recent replenishment of the International Development Association, IDA, um, something we could not have uh, advanced uh, without uh, your support and a significant effort and a milestone for the world's poorest countries. So thank you. Um, while we address these exceptional uh, overlapping crises, and then many of them, Honorable Dia, you mentioned climate change as well at the start, uh, health education, we're focused on our shared commitment to support uh, development outcomes that are uh, green, more inclusive, and, and more resilient for us, but also for, for future generations. Youth have been particularly hard hit by school closures, uh, job losses, uh, regression in health and nutrition, and that's contributed to a loss of human capital and some prospects that we will explore a little bit later in today's conversation. And even before the pandemic, uh, more than uh, you know, 250 million youth, um, uh, often women also, were not in education or training or employment, and this number uh, has uh, not improved. Uh, since the outset of the pandemic, uh, a concern that many of you I know will be uh, um, uh, looking to address. And as young parliamentarians, you're absolutely uniquely positioned to understand the perspectives of the younger generations who feel the brunt of these many intractable challenges and, and are looking for uh, uh, um, uh, a, a more tangible uh, 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 outcomes, better prospects, and, and a sense of real hope um, that they can be reversed. And uh, also as more recent graduates in some cases, I'm assuming, or parents of school uh, age children, you're much more likely to understand firsthand the circumstances that are affecting uh, education and education outcomes in your home countries. Um, this is a, a very important group and very close to uh, you know, the work that, uh, uh, that we do at the World Bank, particularly uh, those of us who are engaging constituencies in, in driving forward uh, the important uh, cause of development. But MPs under age uh, 40 make up some, I think, the, about 17, 18% of parliamentarians worldwide. So while a somewhat smaller group, still incredibly significant group of change makers that represent generations of tomorrow. And we're really proud to be working uh, with you and, uh, and delighted to be able to provide a platform uh, where these views can be exchanged and, and, and your voices and development issues can be amplified. I was particularly pleased, I should say, uh, that a recent uh, survey that uh, uh, looked at uh, the top issues the parliamentary network um, members are concerned with, and they include climate uh, change, education, uh, digital technologies, and health. And these correspond really well uh, to our institution's priorities of investing in human capital. And I'm, I'm very happy that my colleague Jaime Saavedra will talk us through that. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 making uh, uh, development uh, greener, inclusive, and more resilient for the future. Um, we're very keen to work with you. Uh, we're absolutely uh, thrilled to be able to provide the relevant data and knowledge that you may need in, in these exchanges uh, and in tackling the issues that are facing all of us uh, today. I hope um, and I'm confident that today's meeting will continue to provide a platform uh, where we can further enhance uh, what we're already seeing in our own respective contexts 
um, and that we can have the opportunity to uh, learn more about the challenges of education and learning poverty and the much needed urgency of action associated with it. I want to thank you all very much. And once again, a warm welcome to all the members um, of the Global Young MPs. And I will um, uh, hand over to Honorable Dia now um, for uh, our next intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sheila, for that wonderful um, opening. And yes, I do agree, being a youth member myself, that young parliamentarians play a very significant role in uh, you know, creating change and, and being a part of the change that we'd like to see. The educational sector is a, a very important one, and this contributes thoroughly to the development of nations across the world. Uh, we talk about economic growth, we're talking about how we can achieve sustainable development as a whole, and, and, and that is a connectivity between, you know, economic, social and environment. And I think the youth really does play a big role in that. So thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction to start off this hopefully lively discussion amongst parliamentarians across the world. Uh, right now, I would like to shift our attention to um, a poll. So there, please do make the most of the Q&A uh, section of your Zoom. Uh, right now, I would assume there is a poll that has popped up on your screen. And the question is as follows, how does education rank as a national priority amongst your constituents? So if you could quickly answer this question, we will go back in discussing uh, this uh, this question at the end of the session, but do give your answer as follows, and I will give you a couple of seconds to do so. And yeah, I do encourage all of you to take part. All right, thank you very much. Now we will head on to our next presentation. We will have a presentation um, by Jaime. Jaime is the Global Director of Education in the World Bank Group. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Jaime is currently, he currently uh, leads the education global practice at the World Bank Group. He rejoined the World Bank Group in 2017 from the government of Peru, where he served as Minister of Education from 2013 through to 2016, contributing to improved performance by Peru's education system as measured by international learning assessments and a reform in the university system. Very honest honored to have you here, Jaime, and I, I do extend the floor to you to give your remarks. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Dia. Um, I want to share my screen, so let me try uh, to do that first. I just want to check if, uh, if it looks well. Your screen is showing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. So, um, just hold on one second. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you so much. So um, it is it is great to be to be here uh, with um, with a group of young um, parliamentarians who I'm sure will make the difference in their countries um, in order to make sure that we give our children the education that they deserve. Um, I hope that in this poll where you were asked, we have been asked, how does education rank as a national priority? I hope that it was number one. Um, but um, my sense is that that answer will probably be heterogeneous. Well, it might be number one in some countries, but not necessarily in all. And we need to make sure that that's, that that's the case. And what do I, why do I say that? It's because we are living the worst education crisis in a century with the uh, gigantic um, school closures that we have had and the uh, very heterogeneous performance of remote, the remote learning efforts in most of our countries. Uh, we have had an interruption that we have never, I mean, globally, 
in basically all countries, rich and poor, um, that we have never seen in the last in the last century. Um, in February or March of 2020, in the context of a world that was already, as I'm going to mention, that was already living a learning crisis, even before the pandemic, we were already in trouble, right, in terms of the level of learning in all our countries. In that context, um, countries chose to close schools with the idea that that will be a, an important um, um, tool in order to reduce the rate of infections. Actually, we didn't have a lot of information if that's what going to be the case. So the benefits of the school closures were not really clear, but we are seeing that the cost of the school closures are extremely high. Um, and that's what the data is starting to show and has the, is data that hasn't been accumulated during the last um, uh, during the last year. Um, as you see in that in that graph, globally we're talking about 307 days of school of 307 school days closed um, on average, much larger in South Asia and in Latin America. Uh, North America also see very long school closures, but many were partial in the sense that some states were open, some schools were open and others were closed. But in terms of full closures, South Asia, Latin America, and their uh, middle, and after that, Middle East and, the Cari and, North, and North Africa were the regions in which we saw the longest uh, school closures. And unfortunately, we're seeing many countries that are, are, are opening just now, I mean, just a few weeks ago. So we go from countries from, from Philippines to Peru to Uganda, in which uh, schools are just being open as of as, as we speak. Um, now, before the pandemic, and this is if, the, if, if we were be having this discussion in uh, 2019, I would have been saying that we were living a learning crisis. And why we were we saying that? Because using just one indicator uh, related to education, there are many outcomes in education that we care about. But if we just look at the, um, uh, the what we call learning poverty, which is the percentage of children who cannot read and understand a simple text by the age 10. Um, so kids at the end of primary, right? If we look at all children at age, at age 10 in a, in, a, in, a, in a country, you would say, well, all children should be able to read at that age. But unfortunately, the, number, the percentage of children who could not read and understand a simple text was 53% in low and middle income countries which was already configuring, as I was saying, a learning crisis. Post-COVID, well, oh, two years later, I would say, because we're really not completely out of the woods in terms of this pandemic, uh, where simulations show that the number could be increasing to 70%, right? So almost three-fourths of children, right? Uh, many of them attending, attending school, but that have gone through these gigantic inter interruptions and where it was very weak uh, effectiveness of remote learning, um, might be witnessing right a very sharp increase in their uh, inability right to have the uh, basic competencies that they need for life. Now, why do we worry about uh, such a simple indicator as as learning poverty? Because it is it is morally unacceptable right these levels of learning poverty. All children have the right to education, an education that will provide them the skills or the basic skills that they need for a productive life. This is economically unjustifiable because we do have globally the financial and the technical means in order to provide at least basic education to all children. And these high rates of learning poverty are an early warning indicator that many education goals that are included in the SDG in the Sustainable Development Goals number four are in jeopardy. So this is an extremely urgent, urgent task where we, um, we should aspire to eliminate learning poverty and that aspiration is akin to the goal of ending hunger or ending extreme poverty, right? So, in in terms of the uh, of the importance of the uh, of the of the challenge, now if we if we think about what are the uh, different impacts um, of the pandemic, um, this as I was saying, this th this crisis that it's um, the worst that we have seen in the last century in education have critical economic, financial, and social costs. Um, we have seen impacts on mental health. There is, from the data that we have in some countries, uh, there is a 100% increase in depression and anxiety symptoms. We have uh, estimated that 24 million additional students might drop out of the school systems, as mainly because many of them are working now or uh, have been completely disconnected right, from the school experience. Several hundred million children 
uh, missed a daily school meal. That is what I mean. The the, the school was providing them their main the, their main daily daily meal, and that was lost for several months. Um, and when I was talking before that uh, there is a there is a uh, an increase in learning poverty, so a reduction in the human capital accumulation and competencies for life that might have an impact in terms of the future earnings of this of these children and young people. And our estimation so far is that this generation, um, those kids who happen to have between five and twenty some twenty four year between five and twenty four years old during this pandemic, they might be losing $17 trillion uh, in terms of future future income. And here I'm talking about losses for the economy as a whole. I'm talking about losses for that generation. That $17 trillion is equivalent to 14% of the global GDP, just for you to have an idea of the magnitude of that, of that number. And, and we are also worried about a potential inequality catastrophe. And why, why, why we say that? Because on one hand, we can have a large generational inequality, right? This generation will be harmed in terms of their competencies compared to the previous and the next generation, unless we do something very, very urgent today in our education systems. Uh, there is inequality across education levels because even with the, with, the, with the attempts of remote learning that we saw in many countries, secondary education kids maybe have were able to have some engagement in the other extreme early child education, which we have many for many years have been saying that early child education have the highest social and private returns, basically disappeared, was wiped out of the planet for two years, uh, almost entirely. So, and, and, and then finally, um, the, we're worried about inequality across socioeconomic, the socio, socioeconomic spectrum. We already have some data for some countries about, um, about, about that, because the well, the better off in all countries, within all countries, the better off, which had a high uh, broadband internet at home, who have books at home, a space to study, support and supportive family, family environment, environment, was all, all those kids were able to have some sort of engagement with education systems and some sort of engagement with their teachers. On the other extreme, extreme, there are many other kids who didn't have any of that. Right? Not inter no internet connection, not a, not, not a, a, an adequate place at home to sleep, to, to, um, to study. Uh, at most, maybe a connection by WhatsApp with, uh, with, their, with their teachers. So very, very different experiences across the socioeconomic socio spectrum. So without urgent action, the future of this generation is at risk. If we think of the uh, learning trajectory of one, one young uh, person, one student, in, in normal times, what we have seen is that with the school closures, there's forgotten and foregone learning, right? That has not been achieved during, unfortunately, during in many cases very long periods, right? Almost two years in some in some cases. If schools do not adapt to the current needs of children, then learning losses might be might continue accumulating, or learning could be very flat. Remember that teachers will be receiving today a fifth grader that will have the competencies or skills of a third or a second grader, given the school, in, this, the, the school interruptions. So we cannot teach that fifth grader the curriculum of fifth grade. We need to adapt the school to, the, to what that uh, child needs today. If not, that child will be lost and he will drop out again, right? So we really adapt, need to adapt our systems to what these uh, uh, children need. And only there is that we will have an accelerated trajectory that will allow us to recover Right, those forgotten and foregone uh, learning. We have a few lessons, and before going and and to con and, and to conclude with some uh, lines of action of what countries uh, should be doing and what some countries are already doing. I want to share a couple of lessons of uh, of this crisis and this period of attempts of remote learning. One is that learning is intensive in human interaction. Right, when we were been saying, uh, look, uh, during the past year, that technology. Can and can be super in, in, important and can re, even replace teachers. We know that that's not true, right? Technology is about social interaction. Uh, I'm sorry, learning is about social interaction. Learning is about that that magic uh, between the teacher and the student, or between a student and their and and and, uh, and her peers. And in that regard, many parents also have understood that effective teachers are absolutely critical and are more critical than ever. A teacher as a coach, as someone who can inspire, and have, have someone who can who can uh, support 
um, uh, students in their learning process. However, having said that, um, the digital divide, divide must be closed, and that's a huge challenge for all countries. Technology, which has the potential to be a great equal equalizer, as a potential today, is still a great unequalizer, right? And, and the future that we see is about balancing technology and closing the digital divide, but balancing technology with the human factor. Now, today, in order to recover from the, uh, from the impact of this, um, uh, of this pandemic, there are several, uh, sev uh, several lines of action that uh, countries must follow in order to be able to accelerate the learning process. First is we, reach, we need to reach every child and make sure that they come back to school. Schools are open uh, or, or are open in many, in many places, but re return to school is not to, going to be automatic, right? Children, we need to have very strong communication campaigns and work at the community level to make sure that we will enroll absolutely all children. Second, countries need to assess where are children in terms of their learning levels. Right. We need to know at the national level where we are in terms of in, in terms of learning. We know about that in a few countries. We have estimations today of what are the current learning levels in uh, some states in India, in, in Karnataka, in Gujarat. We know about uh, Sao Paulo. We know about impacts in South Africa. And we know in a few countries that learning levels have gone down and they have gone down in an unequal basis. But there are many, many countries who are not assessing the learning levels. So we need to know where we are. And also teachers need to have the tools in order to measure where, where their children are. Third, we need to prioritize teaching the fundamentals. We need to be pragmatic, right? We need to recover two or three, two years lost and another year of, of learning forgotten. And we need to do that fast and we need to prioritize. We need to be pragmatic. We need to prioritize numeracy, literacy, and social emotional skills. Right? And uh, school systems will need to help their, their, their teachers in order to do that prioritization. Fourth, we need to increase catch-up learning, where we need to make sure that at the, in each one of the classroom, uh, we use a structured pedagogy, we, need, we use methods of teaching at the right level so that each student gets the support that they need. That we don't teach to the curriculum, but we teach to the level that each child is. Um, and, and also we need to make sure that in, in some cases to expand instructional time, the day, the week, the year, we need to be super pragmatic. And finally, we need to develop social, so psychosocial health and well-being uh, support uh, for both teachers and, and, for, and for students. Now, doing all this, you will, you will say, look, in, increasing the, uh, I mean, adjusting the school calendar, prioritizing the curriculum, I, I organize a structured pedagogy, providing more tutors to, to students, assess, uh, assessing learning. Oh, that's difficult. And the answer is yes. This is a complicated set of interventions, but it's absolutely essential. Unfortunately, public policy is not easy. It is complicated, but it's absolutely urgent that we, uh, uh, that, that we, that, that we work in this area. Because this today is the opportunity to implement a new vision. It is the opportunity to not to go back to where we were, because we were already having a learning crisis before. So countries have to think in which way I can use this or this, this political window of opportunity that I have in order to generate more equitable, inclusive, and resilient systems, right? Because we know another pandemic or any other natural resource disaster might happen. So that's why we need to invest in technology. We need to invest in better conditions and conditions at home because there has to be continuity of the, of the learning process. So we need, be, we need to build more resilient systems. But um, uh, the, the, I wanna close with, uh, with a call for a, a sense of urgency. Right? The world is facing the worst education crisis uh, in a century. Many children have lost um, uh, many, many months of learning. If we don't do something today, they might not recover from this, from this shock. So that's, that's what I say that the time to act is now, right? The millions of children have been affected by the pandemic worldwide, and that represents our collective future. So we, we must urgently mobilize at the national and at the international uh, level to ensure that this generation can catch up and that we don't miss, and we, the, 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 the catch up on this missed learning and that we make sure that we don't lose this generation. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Amy, for such an incredible uh, talk that you've just given us. 
And, uh, you know, one of the most important stressing point that was mentioned before was that children have the right to education. And I think this is really important for us to internalize uh, the health crisis, COVID, you know, this has led to the deprivation of the access to, to education generally. And I love the fact that you mentioned that it's time for us to innovate mm -hmm. and use technology as a means to, you know, um, to, to increase the access of education worldwide. I think a lot of countries, and I'm sure a lot can come into this, don't necessarily have access to the right technologies and the right infrastructures. A country like Indonesia, for example, this is the biggest archipelago in the world, but not everyone, especially during the pandemic have access to technology and therefore access to education and I mean you mentioned the loss of 17 trillion dollars of income of future income this is very significant and so we do need to find answers right now and today and so I'd like to stress again uh, how in the future conversations to really think about how we can innovate and how we can work together in, in this sector so thank you very much Amy for that wonderful uh, talk that you've given us I'd like to remind everybody here uh, for those of you joining if you could kindly submit ideas for legislative innovations to promote education outcomes you can you know participate by typing on the chat and share some of your ideas so we can you know uh, uh, speak on these uh, issues within you know the next hour that we have together and uh, please if you do have any questions feel free to ask away in the q a section now I'd like to proudly um, uh, introduce Honorable Nima Lugangira from Tanzania. She is a member of parliament from uh, Tanzania and representing the NGOs in the parliament of Tanzania. She is chair of the Parliamentary Caucus on Food Safety and member of the Committee on HIV, TB and Drugs, as well as the Committee on Social Services and Community Development. You are an inspiration, I'm sure, for a lot of the youth members in your countries and now all of us. So we, we do look forward to hearing more about what you have to say and I would like to extend the floor to you. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so as introduced, my name is um, Nema Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament in Tanzania. Uh, it's my first term in office. Uh, became a parliamentarian in our last general elections in October um, 2020. And I first wish to sincerely thank the World Bank and the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF for bringing us um, together today. And um, the two previous speakers were very inspirational and Mr. Jamie, your presentation was very, very inspirational. Um, I'm delighted that the in International Parliamentary Network for Education, which I'm a very active member of, is also co-hosting this education, which we, is co-hosting this um, discussion, which is very timely, especially because, um, you know, we need to discuss and come up with innovations to eliminate learning poverty. Um, and what I would like to, what I would like to contribute, or rather to say is that, it's important we build an understanding of global learning crisis, as well as the global political um, support towards achieving improved foundational literacy and numeracy outcomes, which is also a priority for IPNED. And I just wanted to quickly um, also highlight the importance of recognizing the differences between our countries. You know, I'm coming from Tanzania, um, you know, um, amongst the least, it's the least developing, developed country. And sometimes if we come up with solutions that cut across, you know, the globe as a general, we might miss certain issues. And I'll just highlight a few um, important areas that I think we need, we need to look at. One is when we're talking about um, making reference to Jamie's presentation, the rapid, uh, the rapid slide, some of the items written there are not applicable to a country like Tanzania. So when we're coming with these interventions, we need to be sure how applicable is it to certain countries. And here I'll touch on issues of technology and, and digitalization. Uh, for example, during COVID-19, Tanzania didn't go through a lockdown, but all schools closed. But because all schools closed, it meant that the children did not learn anything at all 
for the entire period that schools closed. Why? Because our schools are not connected. You know, we, we haven't reached the stage where there's school connectivity. So when we're coming up with these solutions, um, I would just like to appeal that it's very important to strike that balance and make sure that they will be applicable in, our, in you know, some of our countries. Now, having said that, I'll quickly um, go to what I also wanted to say. Um, I've been invited here today to provide a reflection on some of the actions that parliamentarians can take to tackle this crisis, both nationally and globally. So I'm just going to quickly highlight three main areas. Um, the first one is collaboration. So the three areas are collaboration, accountability, and financing. So under collaboration, I think what we need to do is all of us, as we're doing right now, come together, have a collaboration at the global level, building on, promise, on promising practices that we're hearing here today, some of which have already been said. But also it's very important to trickle it down to the local level. And that can be done through supporting teachers, through supporting parents, learners, and also working together with civil society and local communities. And in particular, when we work with civil society, their critical role can be to ensure that there is data and evidence for the learning crisis. Um, and then I'll quickly go to the second item. And, and there, sorry, while, while I'm still talking about collaboration, you know, when, when we're looking at the lack of learning, the lack of learning quality assessment data, you know, that prevents so many of our governments from accurately at assessing and addressing a learning crisis. In most of our countries, learning data is not collected at all. So if we're looking for solutions, how can we work with the World Bank to ensure that we come up with interventions that will support developing countries to, to collect learning data? You know, I think that's a very critical point, and that is where the collaborate the importance of collaboration. And you know, that's why up to date, quality data on children's learning is so critical. Therefore, we need to we need to encourage our governments to work with the national and international organizations to come up with best practices on how can we assess learning through large scale and also the regular learning assessments. Um, the second point was accountability. When we're talking about accountability, we too, as parliamentarians, need to hold our governments accountable towards children's learning outcomes. We need to encourage our governments to commit to setting clear targets on foundational literacy and numeracy. Most of our governments don't have clear targets. And once we have those clear targets, they need to be crossed. We need to undertake a cross sectoral approach to develop clear, evidence backed plans to reach these targets. Because oftentimes we have very good targets on paper, but when it comes to implementing, you find it's a total mismatch. So there needs, a, there needs to be a way to track this and also to go back to the drawing board and reorganize ourselves if we see there are any challenges. Again, this doesn't necessarily need to apply to the domestic education policy, but parliamentarians in donor countries, they too can ask their governments to commit on setting key targets on foundational literacy and numeracy as part of the ODA, the Official Development Assistant Investments. And here again on accountability, most of us as parliamentarians, we get into parliament with our own um, backgrounds. We need capacity building on this agenda so that we too can voice, can advocate, and can sort of police the, the, the governments and the system in implementing this. So, you know, as part of these initiatives, what is the plan towards capacitating parliamentarians to hold their governments accountable? And um, lastly is the financing part. As we're clear today, there are so many dimensions to the learning crisis, but a key factors of which I'm very pleased to hear um, some of them were mentioned here, um, were mentioned here today, is that, you know, the, the International Parliamentary Network for Education is, is working with a global partnership for education to develop a parliamentary toolkit on education, on domestic education financing. So I think such a toolkit will also enable um, a lot of parliamentarians to know how can we advocate for domestic financing in education, because most of our governments highly are highly dependable on foreign um, foreign invest, you know, foreign contributions, do, don, donor funding, etc. Um, but again, 
that toolkit with the support of World Bank and the parliamentary network for World Bank and IMF, it can really capacitate and empower parliamentarians to be able to advocate for domestic financing, but also scrutinize the budgets clearly to see where is the government putting their money in and where could the government potentially put their money in and what can be the, the potential um, impact of doing so. I want to finish by saying something on nutrition. I'm a big advocate for nutrition and you know, high quality school feeding programs play such an important role in supporting children's learning and nutrition. But when Jay, um, going back to Jamie's presentation, um, the challenge that you raised was that with COVID, it, it led to a lot of children now not getting access to their school meals. But now for country like Tanzania, children are not getting school meals. So you can imagine how disadvantaged we already are. So what can we do to ensure that we support developing countries to at least reach the minimum level, minimum acceptable level for children in schools to be able to get school meals? How can we do that, especially when our countries, when our countries have got such a huge um, demand of all sectors wanting a piece of the budget? What can we do um, in that space? So. To conclude, um, I'm again very, very grateful for this opportunity, and I'm particularly grateful to see that um, the World Bank, the Parliamentary Network on World Bank and IMF, Interparliamentary Network for Education and all other stakeholders are giving opportunities to us parliamentarians from developing countries to come on the global stage and share our views. Having said that, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nima, for that wonderful uh, information, piece of information that you've provided with us. I'd like to remind everyone that she is also representing the International Parliamentary Network. So thank you very much. And yes, uh, I can and we can all commend that we do need to mobilize and present interventions you know, together to support um, how developing countries can be supported, really, uh, it, when we speak of the education sector. So thank you and how governments can work together with the national and international organizations. I think this is really important and it's something that we can all really just work on uh, going forward. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to extend the floor now to Honorable Sahar Al-Bazar. Um, Honorable Sahar, I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, in Bali. So she came to Bali during the Interparliamentary um, Union, and she is uh, not only Member of Parliament and Deputy Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, but she is also President of the IPU Forum of Young Parliamentarians. Uh, Honorable Sahar has been a Member of Parliament since 2020 and is Deputy Chair uh, of the Foreign Affairs Committee, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, you know she has extensive experience in development and civil society in Egypt, Somalia, uh, and Kenya, addressing women's empowerment, education, and youth in, um, uh, employment. So, Honorable Sahar, I will extend the floor to you. You have four minutes, and I'm sure that you will maximize on the time that you have uh, in front of you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Honorable DM, and uh, fellow panelists and uh, young parliamentarians. Uh, I'm very pleased to address you um, today as the president of the IPU Forum of Young MPs and also the member of the Egyptian Parliament. Um, just quick uh, info for those who doesn't know the IPU, it's a union for the world's parliament. Um, it represents 178 member countries who represents uh, over 6 uh, billion people around the world. And the Forum of Young MPs is a permanent body of the IPU. Uh, I, I have to give a special hello to the moderator and uh, thank her and her country for recently hosting our assembly uh, in Indonesia last month. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we are facing multiple crises around the world, several conflicts, pandemic, and the climate change, and more. These crises were created not by the young people, although these young people will be the ones who will face it and will try to address it. And education is the key tool for them to be empowered to face such crises and try to brainstorm and find solutions for it. 
the World Bank tell us that 53% of the children uh, in low and uh, middle uh, income countries cannot read. Uh, cannot read by the end of the par of, at the uh, end of primary school, and during the pandemic, one in eight children were left without access to education. These kind of um, crises and like the pandemic really took children out of the right to get educated. And as I said, education is the key that will empower us as young people and as children to face whatever crisis the world face. But the good news is that young MPs were very busy formulating solutions. At the IPU Global Conference of Young Parliamentarians, we came together and shared practices to strengthen education. And I will give you some examples of what we have been calling parliaments to do. First and foremost, we must ensure free and universal access to education for all we cannot leave anyone behind. Second, we must apply gender, age, and diversity, diversity dimensions in education-related laws and policies. Third, we must adopt budgets that meet UNESCO's target of spending 6% of national GDP on education. Fourth, we should prioritize education that strengths skills that meet future needs including science, technology, engineering, mathematics, for both boys and girls. I'm also happy to share some of the examples of um, efforts that has been done in my home country, Egypt. First, expanding the access to early uh, childhood learning. The Education 2.0 program that we have, it worked to build schools uh, that includes early education programs in students' villages. The aim is to teach essential skills of reading, comprehension, writing, math, and English to the third graders. Second, implementing learning villages. Egypt has adopted the innovation approach in intergenerational education reform in vulnerable rural areas, rural areas by teaching primary age children how to read as well as their mothers so that children are allowed to experience the literacy work at home and at school. Uh, third is linking education to technology. While the Education 2.0 uh, uh, program was initially stagnant because of COVID, COVID was somehow a bless in that part in Egypt because it accelerated the digitizing process of education. It helped pro providing free space online for students to find educational content and edu educational technology that was provided to 26,000 classrooms. Finally, educa educating refugees, and this is very important during the crisis that we see in conflicts in different areas in the world. Out of the 200,000 refugees who are seeking asylum in Egypt, 40% of them are children who became reliant on the Egyptian education system. The Egyptian government is using the model created by the UN Refugee Reliance Response Plan to help these vulnerable children seize and get their education. Dear colleagues, I wish to close by saying that although we are MPs of individual countries, so many crises we face across borders, we need coordinated international responses. This is why meetings like this one are very important. I want to thank again uh, the World Bank for hosting this meeting, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very thank you much. much. Thank you very much, Honorable Sahar, for uh, your amazing remarks, of course. And you know, you talked a lot about how also we can really just come together in achieving the sustainable goals and this is something that we can hone from each other's experiences and uh, be good examples for each other but also opportunities to cooperate and collaborate going forward so thank you for sharing your thoughts on this very important subject and uh, if i could now lead everyone uh, to the next poll so we have a second poll uh, with the following question i do encourage all of you to take part and to select 
which answer fits best to you. And the question is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your country's use of technology to advance education outcomes? I will give you a few seconds to do that. Again, this is really important. You know, the use of technology is very much in correlation to access of education in general. The more we have technology or access to technology, the more we have access to education, especially at a very difficult time right now with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how everything is starting to become digitalized. So I hope you had the chance to quickly um, answer the poll question. And without further ado, I will be extending the floor next to Honorable Mariam. Honorable Mariam, she is a member of parliament and deputy chair of the Foreign Relations Committee and member of the Education and Science Committee in Georgia. Um, she is uh, you know, a member of parliament of the 10th Convocation Political Party Georgian Dream, a deputy chairperson of Foreign Relations Committee. She also participates in gender policy development in the country through the Gender Council at the Parliament. Uh, she is, you know, like everyone here, is such an inspiration at such a young age and being given such a big responsibility in everybody's respective countries. And Honorable Mariam is, is of course, one of them. And please, I would like to extend the floor to you. You do have four minutes. I'm so sorry. I do have to remind everybody of the time constraints, but I'm sure you will utilize this time as effectively as possible. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we'll uh, express my sincere appreciation to you for organizing the event and having such a wonderful platform for still empowering the young MPs to further um, join our efforts in having the uh, better um, world and to live in more educated world, which leads us to the peace. Uh, it's really special honor for me being as a former World Bank group member and also with the current uh, uh, high responsibility, uh, especially with the education science uh, committee responsibilities. Um, and especially today, because today in Georgia, uh, we celebrate Mother Language National Day. So it's kind of a symbolic to be part of uh, today's event today. So before sharing uh, some of the Georgia's experience, a uh, few words about the importance of education in child literacy. We live in a really crazy uh, world today. And I strongly believe that education is a key in having a peaceful world. And what we see is that uh, with the educated people who never lead us uh, to such crime and immoral actions. So uh, with this, I would like to join the uh, previous uh, colleagues to express the strong support to Ukraine and to our friend nation. Um, just to uh, briefly give you some of the uh, core uh, principles which Georgia has recently conducted and hereby I would like to also thank the World Bank Group with the extensive support in this direction. One of the core principles is that the uh, Ministry of Education and Science of Georgia has um, adopted the National Strategy on Education and Science 2022-2030, uh, 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 which is uh, having the core three pillars, quality, equity, and governance. And one of the strategic goals of the new strategy is uh, the high quality education process, which is oriented on support and development by all institutions of early and preschool education. This also envisages improving qualifications and professional development of caregivers, improvement of learning environment, engagement of parents in the work of preschool education, and so on and so forth. So with this, Ministry of Education has started implementing targeted activities on preschool education level to improve uh, those uh, high kind of uh, uh, importance, uh, which is highlighted in the strategy to ensure better transition from kindergarten to schools and eliminate learning poverty. Public kindergarten services are free of charge in Georgia. With early and preschool education, Ministry of Education uh, again uh, uh, brought the 
preschool education closer to general education. And from the parliamentary, we have adopted in 2016, the law of uh, Georgia on early and preschool education, which is again uh, promoting the, uh, these connections. In order to ensure the quality, the state standards are being revised. And as you may be well aware, we have uh, uh, we are associated con uh, country of uh, Europe, Europe uh, European Union. We have recently submitted the application, and full hour standards and quality, especially in education, is harmonizing to EU standards and methodology as well. The school readiness program is also part of this process, and we are promoting that direction. Uh, ministry is also implementing various programs and activities uh, to ensure the quality general education and eliminate of learning poverty, especially at early stage of schooling, by means of developing 21st century skills among students and preparing them for life. Their national uh, uh, curriculum is uh, a competence-based curriculum focusing on the development of skills relevant to modern society and life. Uh, also, full general education is again free of charge in Georgia. And general education in this direction outlines key, fun uh, key six functional skills, which is critical thinking, creativity, communication, cooperation, citizenship, character, like willpower. Uh, we also are working on improving the competent of general education reform and competencies, including the uh, teachers as, as well. On the part of the inclusive educational multidisciplinary team operates in the ministry to ensure the whole coverage of those directions. And in 2018, uh, amendments was made to the law of Georgia on general education, which is promoting that direction. Um, uh, so on that regard, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, one part is uh, regarding the uh, teach children in the first language, starting with early childhood education. With regards to the first language issue, we have um, again challenge from our uh, northern neighbor, Russia, uh, which has occupied our 20% of territories where our citizens are not able to access the first, their mother tongue uh, um, uh, like learning uh, in the schools, which is one of the core challenges which Georgia is facing. But on the other side, from the ed tech, which again is one of the key direction of this today's session, ed tech is one of the uh, kind of, uh, uh, as it was mentioned by previous um, uh, um, our Aime uh, uh, Saavedra, uh, it's a kind of a potential to be a great equalizer. And again, same time, you know, we have to make sure that it also is uh, balanced, right? So uh, this is kind of quickly uh, overview. I hope that uh, the timing was uh, right. Uh, and I'll be glad to further uh, elaborate more on in depth in this direction. Once again, hereby I express my readiness to further Co kind of continue this collaboration with the members and interested people to strengthen our power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mariam, for your um, remarks, of course. And, uh, you know, you stressed a lot uh, of points with response to really just the quality of education. I think that was one of the most important things that you mentioned. And um, I think how can we um, countries all over the world not only think about the access of education itself, but also making sure that the quality of education is in par with the development of um, every country worldwide, really. You know, are we teaching the right skills? Are we honing the right skills for uh, people to learn to then contribute to the future economy? So I think what the, the point of you stressing on the quality, I think, is, is one of the most important things that you have mentioned. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, giving us your thoughts on that. And now, uh, because we are a little bit running out of time, but I would like to now extend the floor to Honorable Cynthia Lopez Castro from Mexico. 
Um, you know, we had the pleasure of meeting before in IPU. I remember you were in Bali as well as Honorable Sahara. So it's great to see you on screen now. Uh, she is uh, the member of the Chamber of Deputies of Mexico. She is also a member of the IPU Board of Young Parliamentarians. And yes, I would like to now extend the floor to you for you to give us some of your remarks on today's topic, while also stressing on the importance of not only technology, but also innovation within the educational sector. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, Aurora, that we met in Valley like one month ago, and, and she was an extraordinary host for this important event of the IPU. So I'm very happy to see you as a moderator. I also see a Honorable Sahar that is our president of Junk MPs. It's very, it's very, I'm very happy to see you, uh, my dear colleagues. So um, it is a great joy to join you today in this virtual event representing my country, Mexico, and to join a fellow parliamentarian colleagues from all over the world. On Dublin, education is one of the top of the agenda for both developed and developing countries. So being it a pathway to secure development, growth and wealth for our societies and for the whole world. As the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, we are inextricably linked by globalization and interdependence. And probably one of the most affected sectors uh, by this pandemic was education. According to the UNESCO, at the height of the pandemic, schools, universities, and other learning institutions were closed in more than 190 countries, disrupting the education of 1.6 billion students with hundreds of millions of children and youth unable to continue their learning. So these figures are alarming as a young and innovative parliamentarians. It is our job to work to fix this and facilitate access to opportunities in education and the labor market. So this is why I would like to publicly acknowledge the World Bank's initiative to introduce the concept of learning poverty, to galvanize actions towards improving education and reading proficiency among our children. So let me briefly share uh, our experience in Mexico, my country. So like in other developing countries in Mexico, we have the capacity shortage and disparities between the most industrialized central and north northern parts of Mexico and the less developed southern states like Chiapas, Oaxaca, Yucatan, Tabasco. So Mexico is geographically, ethnically and linguistically a diverse country. So we have like more than 60 languages that are spoken mostly by indigenous ethnic groups in the South as, uh, as that is a very important region. So uh, it is within these underfunded rural regions, the educational participation and attainment rates are extremely low. So literacy rates in the states of Chiapas and Oaxaca, that these are Southern states, home to the largest percentage of indigenous peoples in Mexico are more than 10 times lower than in Mexico City or the Northern state of Nuevo Leon. So in this case, elementary school participation is near universal and dropout rates are close to zero in some states from the center of the country like Querétaro. But the situation in impoverished rural states is more problematic. So moreover, the pandemic emphasized layers in disparities such as technological and economic difficulties. However, both the public and the private sector have made continuous and significant efforts to close the gap, including the supply of a significant number of computers at school by the Secretariat of Public Education. So we have a problem, Telesecundaria, that it's a Mexican model of education that has placed since 1968 uh, with the goal of providing uh, secondary education through television broadcast in rural areas and indigenous areas are very difficult to access. So we are convinced that information and communication technologies had the potential to enhance students' essential skills in today's digital age such as critical thinking, 
problem solving and collaborative work and communication com competencies. However, since in Mexico is such a diverse country, we urgently need to improve the infrastructure in rural schools to have access. This is our main problem. I have computer equipment and easily access technology platforms and mobile phones. Also, we must consider teachers training and how to use these technologies to maintain effective communication. What happened in Mexico is with the pandemic in the house, maybe in the rural uh, houses, only one people, uh, one member of the family has mobile phone. So how can the, the, the students can connect if their parents are working? And it, it was not only in the rural, a section of Mexico is also in Mexico City that in one family only one has the opportunity to have a computer or a mobile phone. So technology by itself is not attractive, not a good, uh, not good, not bad. It is a responsibility of teachers to make ICT interest and attractive, fostering collaborative learning. So I am certain that working together and exchanging this experience and points of view that has been very interesting in this important forum um, we will be able to improve education standards in our countries and end the learning poverty this is an available opportunity to listen and learn from each other and to engage the couple to and cooperate with another uh, to strengthen our education system at the country level but also to plan and ahead and ensure an inclusive and equitable education for all at the global level thank you so much it's a pleasure to participate with this, all young people around the world and, and my colleagues uh, that are congress members in different countries thank you so much for the invitation it's a pleasure to be with you thank you thank you very much honorable cynthia for sharing your thoughts on this topic it's so important that you met you did mention about the disparities uh with uh, you know within your country in the north and the south and that plays a part in terms of the access to technology itself um and how technology is is a very important means of sharing information and as a as a means of communicating in general and and being able to really just have people pro uh, have the ability to problem solve. And, and I think those are some of the very interesting key points that you mentioned. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And it's always nice to see you, of course. Uh, I would now like to uh, extend the floor to Honorable uh, Victor. Honorable Victor, he is the member of the European Parliament Romania and Vice President of the Committee on Culture and Education. Uh, Victor is a member of Parliament and he has been the Rapporteur of the European Parliament for the report on shaping digital education policy and an active promoter of the allocation of 10% for quality and inclusive uh, education on the National Recovery and Resilience Facilities as well as 2% to the cultural and creative sector. I think he's played such a predominant role in his country, in Romania. So I'm very excited to not only meet you, but to also learn more about what you have to say on this topic. Uh, you do have four minutes. I'd like to remind again uh, to all the panelists today to make sure that we are conscious on time because we're kind of running out of time, but we do still want to learn um, from you. The floor is yours, Honorable Victor. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to be here with all of you uh, for discussing this important issue of, of education and how we can make uh, our education inclusive, but also digital education, something accessible for as many people as possible across the world. And indeed, I will start by simply saying since the beginning, and this was stressed also from the European Parliament side, that we need a global approach when it comes to those challenges. It is clear right now that, of course, we cannot deal with this issue only individually at national level or even at local level. We have to discuss about this issue globally, but also try to identify means and ways of really producing an impact. And this has been underlined, of course, in all the previous intervention. I really paid attention to uh, each of you. And I noticed that, of course, we have the list of issues. We also sometimes have the list of solutions. But what we are lacking is a couple of things. First of all, is to have the resources allocated specifically to deal with those challenges, synergies at global level, making sure that we are all moving together in the same time at the same pace, 
in order to make sure that everyone has access to education, but also has access to quality education, which is also important to fix those standards. What is also lacking to a certain degree is uh, lack of availability in discussing about the issue of education, but also acting together on these respective issues that everyone wants to defend as being, you know, something that is separate from common approaches, which is not true. So there are many things that are lacking, and of course, in this regard, I will underline uh, a couple of things that can be done and that hopefully that we can do together because I'm, I'm, I'm more pragmatic in my approach and I believe we need, we need, of course, to have results as fast as possible. So first of all, an uh, international legislation, international references, we speak about the right to education. I think we have to redefine that. We have to speak about the right to access quality education in physical format, but also in digital format. And this has changed with the pandemic. We are now speaking about standards. We also speak about digital education being something that can happen. Of course, digital education is more than remote education. So this is very important, again, to look at the definition. Secondly, we need, of course, a multi-stakeholder approach involving us, members of the parliament, or in my case of European parliament, but also teachers, educators, learners, parents, local communities, the private sector. And of course, together with the World Bank, together with other institutions, we need to, of course, increase the visibility of this global sustainable development goal, but in the same time, try to move ahead with concrete milestones, a plan, a plan for education at global level, with concrete targets. So what we are going to do, for instance, in Argentina, or what we are going to do in Mexico, in my own country, Romania, we are in the European Union, we have difficulty. What we do in Africa, what we do everywhere, but really an action plan that we are all following, very concrete, very precise, with the different difficulties and challenges in each part of the world. And of, of course, this means identifying the best methods to do that. The curriculum and how we are approaching this issue, the content that we are making available for everyone involved, the investment in infrastructure, like access to the internet, broadband, but also other tools, access to adequate devices adapted for learning, but because it is not enough to give kids a tablet or a smartphone. This is not an educational device. An educational device is something else. And by the way, in Romania, I was the one together with other stakeholders creating the first Romanian digital education tablet and distributing for free to thousands of kids because we understood that this means something else. Adequate software, adequate apps for education. So we need, of course, to invest more and have this approach. And what we do in Romania should be accessible, for instance, in Tanzania. And what you do uh, in Georgia should be accessible uh, of course, in, uh, in, in the US. But we are not doing that. We are, each of us, living and staying in our own bubbles, trying to resolve the different issues. And unfortunately, this is lacking. And this is what I'm hoping, actually, out of this uh, forum today, this initiative, is to try to build those bridges that will enable us to act together. So of course, the challenges have been underlined very well, and the effects of, of, of what happened during the pandemic the cost of all of that, the cost of remote learning, the cost on the long term when it comes to mental health, future earnings, the, the, the problems of literacy. And of course, we have to do everything at once, and this makes things difficult. So we have to make sure pupils, students have access to get to basic skills, but now we have to develop the digital skills, which makes things even harder. We have to deal with the disparities within our own countries, the low access of remote areas, to education or rural areas, the gender discrepancies, the ethnic discrepancies also when it comes to access to education, the social and regional uh, gaps existing within our own countries, but also global level. But of course, these are realities. We cannot ignore them, but we also need to move ahead. So for me, what is important right now is really we need a common approach to all of that. And this common approach implies, of course, uh, to put all our resources or our, or our know-how together. So my invitation, again, to our colleagues from the International Parliamentary Network for Education, but also to the World Bank, is to try, of course, maybe we can work actively on that, to put together what has been done in each of our countries, especially the ones that want to get involved. So that means the laws, the methods, the technologies, convince each of us, we can convince different players, different stakeholders, to put and make available their technologies for the others to use them. Because we have sometimes free software, free apps. Sometimes we have technologies that have been used in some places in Europe and that can go in other places and still be useful. So let's try to 
to, 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 to convert those, uh, let's say, um, ideas together. And I think our good of, uh, and positive availability to work together. So uh, I'm happy to be here again. You can count on my full support. Uh, in the European Parliament, we have a European Education Alliance. Uh, dozens of MAPs from different member states are really ready to engage also at global level. So you can count on us, and I, I would be more than happy to participate at the more, let's say, at this idea of, of, of making a concrete plan for education at global level, making it inclusive, accessible, and of course, innovative in the same time. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Honorable Victor, uh, for stressing the importance of really just how we can have access to not only quality education, but have this in the physical, but also online environments, especially now, given that, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. So yes, we do, don't have a choice, but to, you know, uh, focus on the online, but having both access is very important. And you've highlighted that quite perfectly and, you know, have an action plan on how countries across the world can mobilize and work together in ensuring that this access is possible. So thank you for highlighting that the, the importance of, of working together. Uh, we have a phrase in Indonesia called gotong royong, which is uh, very much the very essence of uh, working together side by side in achieving a goal. And the goal right now is to extend this access to education, whether physically or online. So thank you uh, for sharing your thoughts. Now I'd like to extend the floor to Honorable Sani. Honorable Sani, she is Member of Parliament and Chair of the Commerce Committee. Um, she is serving her third term as a member of parliament since 2011. She is chair, as I mentioned before, her role covered the entire uh, knowledge change, uh, chain from early childhood education to top scientific research, which I personally think is very cool. Uh, she has also dealt with issues related to culture, sport, youth and religious affairs during the period of 2015 to 2017. So Honorable Sani Gran Lasonen, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced in any way, but the floor is yours and um, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. You did very well with my name, Sanne Gran Lasonen, and greetings from Finland. Dear colleagues all over the world, I'm, I'm so deeply, uh, deeply grateful and I highly value your work, um, Heine, and the World Bank team, and, and yours as well, dear colleagues. The World Bank has put focus on a very important topic, a need to ensure equal right to learn to all children of the world in a world that faces big and monumental challenges like uh, today's topic, learning poverty. And uh, how I see it from, from the Finnish perspective is that we really need to focus on the quality of education. As a former Minister of Education, a member of Finnish Parliament and also mother of two, I would like to share with you today three main themes, maybe a little longer term, that I consider as main topics in the future development of education. Firstly, I'm convinced that highly educated teachers are the most important factor of quality education. As Jaime said, uh, that's the more teachers have the more critical role than, than maybe ever. Uh, if I was asked to point out just one reason behind Finland's success in, in, in the PISA surveys during the past 20 years, I would say that our qualified teachers are the reason. On both primary and secondary level education in Finland, our uh, teachers are required to hold a master's degree. So it's teaching profession in, in Finland is academic profession and, and teachers here are highly valued professionals uh, in, in the Finnish society. And our education system is very much based on trust, which means that our teachers, the academic professionals, they have a great deal of independency, strong autonomy, a lot of freedom in their work. For example, in, in selecting the materials they use and the methods used in everyday uh, school, school work. And my second point would be that the point that I would like to raise today is the importance of early childhood education. The first years of education are the most crucial ones 
and they lay the foundation for all future learning. We adults have the responsibility to build a future where children see hope and prospect for good life. And scientific evidence indicates that children's participation in early childhood education has a positive effect on a child's growth, personal development and learning, and it proactively reduces social exclusion. So there is a very so strong scientific evidence that shows that we really need to focus on early childhood education in the future. And it's also uh, possible to identify earlier uh, possible learning difficulties children may have. So it's very effective. We should focus on, on early childhood education. And the third topic that I want to point out today is functional literacy. Our daily life is very complex and without good reading skills, including uh, strong media literacy skills, there is a bigger risk um, of, of getting lost. Uh, good readers are more, uh, more often also critical thinkers. In fact, considering the huge amount of fake news circulating every day in different media ch channels, a solid base in media, media literacy is very important. Good reading skills are a key to, uh, to successful learning. There is an urg urgent need to promote reading among young children. As we all know, it's very difficult in everyday life even for the adults, that we spend so much more time with our cell phones. But we also need to promote reading among children, like reading stories, reading books. Uh, and that's something that I, I do every night with my children. I, I, I tend to read that to them. And I want, want to focus on that very much, because I see that, that there's a strong link between reading and, and learning, of course. That may seem clear, but it, it's not in a, in, a, in a times like this. Uh, to support better and wider literacy in our country in Finland, we've made a strong national effort during the past years. We've brought together national authorities um, and in, important stakeholders like NGOs, schools, writers, libraries, all to seek solutions to develop young people's literacy competence and their interest in reading. A national literacy strategy has been created in Finland and a lot of activities to support reading are now going on in many parts of our, our country. And, uh, and, and that's something that I see very important. Dear colleagues, we don't have it, uh, that much time, like probably used my minutes already, uh, but how I see it is that education is the strongest tool for us to change the world. And where we see that our children learn and become active members of societies, it's earlier, to, um, it's easier for us to believe that humankind has a positive future. And in times like this, being a politician requi requires persistence and resilience, and the results of our work is often visible only later. Uh, sometimes even a decade is a short time before we can see a change happen. And dear colleagues, Let's not give up. Let's continue to fight for every child's right to learn. An equal and fair society seeks uh, to give opportunities for everyone to study and to shine. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to have this discussion with you. And I, I hope you all are doing well wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Sanin for uh, Sani for the you know remarks that you've given us. I'm sorry I forgot to mention that she for everybody here joining us today. I mean we have 90 participants just to let everybody know, which is incredible to have all of you um, involved in this discussion. But Honorable Asani was the former Minister of Education in Finland, and I do have to agree and that highly educated teachers. Uh, play a huge role in ensuring quality education as a whole. I think this was the first time that we heard it during today's discussion. So I think it's so important to take note of that. How can we educate teachers um, to make sure that, you know, their students are um, can have great access to education in general. So thank you very much, Honorable Sani. And now our last speaker of the day or night for some of us is Honorable Brenda Vargas member of parliament from Argentina. Um, she is uh, also very young, 
um, and has played a prominent role, a very strong presence and work during the pandemic uh, together with the University of Youth of La Matanza. And also, you know, you have become the youngest candidate for national deputy in these elections. And uh, this is, of course, something that is worth noting because we are, of course, very proud of you. And I'd like to extend the floor to you to give your remarks and to conclude our day as well. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for that introduction and your invitation. My name is Brenda. I'm 27. And as was just said, I am the youngest parliamentarian in Argentina. I am new on the job, just like our colleague from Tanzania. So I am focusing now on making certain that our plans and projects are applicable worldwide and that they can also be applied here in our country. I represent the province of Buenos Aires and also the municipality of Matanza, where I live. That is the municipality with 2.4 million in population. And we have 500,000 students going from the lowest to the highest grades in school. So I wanted to tell you about the work that we have been doing to eliminate um, learning poverty. This is something that was launched by UNESCO, and we are part of the network of cities working on learning. Now, these are cities that promote learning by mobilizing resources effectively to promote, as many of you have said, inclusive learning. The idea is to bring back learning, not only in boys and girls who take part, but also to assure learning in families and communities by using modern technology. Matanza, my city, has been recognized because for several years, they have been applying educational public policies. And as Jaime was saying, we recognize that it's necessary to have access to the right to education. Education has to be acknowledged as a human right. Now, we do think that what we need to build on is access in principle to ongoing learning at all levels, because we should not be happy with just allowing Argentinians to learn for the future world, but we think there should be equal opportunities. And in that way, we can have a society that offers possibilities for everyone. Now, we have given 10,000 scholarships for secondary school children and another public policy refers to what was said in the past about a lack of access to technology, to internet, etc. So here we have a plan called Better Schools with Books. There we have books that can be assigned to each child on an individual basis. And that plan is now a national one. It is called A Book to Learn. And with this way, everyone has the necessary didactic resources. And during the pandemic, this has been very helpful to assure connectivity and also for them to be able to do their homework, the work at home with the support of families. We consider that that is something that has to be assured. There has to be an organized community that works with a sense of solidarity so that education can reach the entire population. Also, we have another program called Back to School. That is a program where we work with volunteers from society. They go door to door. And then we have another program for teachers where the teachers could support the learning process. And also going back to school in person. Our municipality is a pioneer in terms of distributing robot kits for primary schools and also by providing 
projectors and screens in all kindergartens, giving access to technology, which is a way for children to be socialized. Also, and equally important, we have a technological innovation center and a university, university innovation center for university careers looking at innovation in technology. Also, we have set up science clubs in different neighborhoods. Those are the smallest administrative unit here in Argentina. Also, we think that in education, we have to look at producing cultural cases so as to promote popular culture, cultures that are part of our country identity. In our countries, there is a combination of several cultures, several nations, and all of that has to be reflected in the education sector. Also, we created a mobile library so as to try to encourage reading. That is something that several speakers have mentioned. And lastly, I wanted to highlight, as was just said by my colleague, we have to be certain that our teachers receive good training. There we're working with ongoing training with our universities. So all of this has been done working with the education community. That means working with people from the education community and the areas of government that are related to education. Here in the municipality of Matanza, the, where I'm a representative, we have a secretary of science and technology, a person who is currently the vice minister of education at the national level. And that is why many of these uh, programs are very advanced and they have been applied throughout the country. So it would be an honor to continue to debate and to add to the proposals we're hearing from other countries. Also, I wanted to say that in the Republic of Argentina, we have a law on uh, sexual education and on environmental law. So both sexual and uh, climate education reaches all children going from uh, very early grades all the way up to adult education. Also, I wanted to say that it's important to incorporate the best practices in terms of dealing with learning poverty. And for that, we need a community that experiences solidarity. So, as was said by the vice president yesterday, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, policies are the result of political decisions or a non-decision. So here there is a political decision so that a young woman, person like me, can come from a poor family, a hardworking family, to be part of national policy making. So I won't take up any more of your time, but I do want to pick up on something that was already said. I think that one important objective has to do with assuring the continuity of communication. We have to make certain that education is a basic human right in our world. And in that way, everyone has access to quality information. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you very much, Honorable Brenda, for sharing your thoughts on this issue. Uh, you did mention again the importance of training for uh, teachers. That was mentioned previously as well, and I think this is a very important thing to ensure good quality education. And uh, you did also mention the access of facilities. This is also very important in terms of libraries, uh, you know, how uh, people and societies have access to books and that can contribute to their knowledge. So thank you so much for highlighting those very important points. And uh, so uh, she is, Honorable Brenda was the last speaker of today's panel. And I'd like to draw our next attention to the polls that we uh, did in the beginning. So. The first poll, as you may remember, the question is, how does education rank as a national uh, priority amongst your constituents? From the results, 
uh, the majority, which is 36%, have mentioned that this is the top three priority. However, 25% mentioned that this is number one. I know, uh, Jaime, you you know expected in the very beginning that this should be the number one priority. So I, I do hope that uh, you know we do increase the the our not only understanding but our concerns for for this in the future in our respective countries to make sure that the governments do act on uh you know the and have the right policies in place so we do make uh education as a national priority and 14 percent of you mentioned top 10 priority and luckily zero percent said not a priority at all because of course without education there is no development without education there is no economic growth and so forth so this is the uh, result of the first poll and now if we can quickly see the results of the second poll and uh, the question being, you know, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your country's use of technology to advance education outcomes? A majority have said weak, very unfortunate. Um, this is this is very, very uh, interesting, yeah? especially at a time like this, where connectivity is, you know, one of the main means of receiving and having access to education. And it turns out that, you know, the, the country's use of technology is weak and many parts of the world and i can commend this about indonesia as well because yes there is a disparity between the rich and the poor those who do have access to, to technology and those who do not um, and so this is a big concern uh, facing a country like indonesia but i'm sure countries worldwide and it turns out that a majority of you have said that and 29 percent mentioned good 24% mentioned, okay, 7% uh, luckily, and this is, I hope we can learn more about who actually said excellence and from what parts of the world, because then that way we can, um, you know, learn how uh, of their best practices, how they have incorporated technology and innovation within the educational sector, and how we can follow in through their footsteps. So thank you very much for participating in that uh, poll. As for now, we would like to head on to the Q&A section. So this section will be primarily aimed at you, Jaime. Um, I, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but there are, uh, I'd like to kind of just, you know, mention two main questions that were um, given to us in response to, again, the education sector and also the how technology plays an important role in ensuring that access to education is, is available. So the first question is from Honorable Chidakwa Harare. Um, I hope I pronounced this right from Zimbabwe. So the question is, how do we ensure that those who lack access to cell phones and internet connections are not left behind? And the second question is from MP Yiza Hoti from the Republic of Kosovo. How can the rapid strategy, which uh, Jaime mentioned he adapted to children with different levels of preparedness um, who may be learning in the same classroom. So how do we uh, adapt the strategy um, going forward? And uh, the last question, uh, there is a, quite a lot here, but uh, I'd like to also highlight Honorable Ago Oliver Bamenju from Cameroon. How can education address inequality as a result of socio-political crises? So these are the three main questions. I hope that uh, you know we can hear some of your thoughts, Jaime, on these questions. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, just to have an idea, um, we'll have another round of they will have only this intervention, just for me to time myself. Yes. Yes, so just to uh, highlight for everybody, the Q&A section is for you, Jaime, to answer. However, after you have answered these questions, I will extend to the, uh, the floor to all panelists that have conveyed their remarks to present their closing uh, remarks to Perfect. end today's. Okay. So I hope that's clear for everybody. That's, yes. that's, that's perfectly fine. So many thanks, Honorable, at the end, and many thanks also to uh, the different uh, members of parliament who have made several com comments. We, I would like to react to those and also to the questions uh, that 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 you were that you were making. So, I mean, start with the, with with the, with some of the questions. And to be frank, I didn't. There was some interruption, and I didn't got well the last one, the third question. 
So if you can repeat that, um, uh, Ms. Dia, that will be great. Yeah, so the last question, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that was from Honorable Ago Oliver, right, from Cameroon. The mm -hmm. question was, how can education address inequality okay. uh, as a result of socio-political crises? Right. And I guess when we speak of crises, we can also um, relate that to the current health crisis that we're currently dealing with as well. Mm -hmm. Look, so no, thank you very much for that. So um, let me mention a few issues. One is the on, regarding the use of the use of technology. As I was saying, technology has a huge potential, but as of today, is still a great equalizer because all countries um, were unable to implement remote learning strategies uh, relying on the internet because just kids would not have access at home. And as someone was saying, even if they had a smartphone, there were, may, might be one smartphone for the whole family. So it was very difficult to really have an, an engagement with um, uh, with with teachers using that. So definitely we are we have a digital divide that has to be closed. I think it was very important some of the points on that that was made by, by the Honorable, Honorable Negrescu that it's not an issue of the software or the hardware. It is an issue of the whole ecosystem, right? Because it's the hardware, yes. It's the hardware, is the software, but it's also the teachers, the teachers' capabilities in order to use technology in an effective way in order to make um, learning a more um, um, more impactful and effective. And actually, that's the most important thing. You can have all the hardware and the software, but you don't have teachers that use that as an additional tool, as it, as, as it should be, then technology will not have an impact. And also, you need to have a whole architecture in order to support the, the use of technological uh, technological um, solutions. It's just not the matter of the of a teacher in a school, then you will need to have a, an expert of techno on technology that will support the teacher. So it's about a whole ecosystem, and it's and it's not easy. Are we moving into that direction? Yes, we will be moving in the right that direction, but it will always be a right a balance between technology and the human factor. If we don't continue investing, as as um, honorable uh, honorable uh, Grand Lassonen was mentioning, if we don't invest in teachers, then those investments in technologies will have very very little very little impact if and maybe zero impact if at the same time we don't invest in the right way now uh some countries will say well but we don't have the resources now to move fast on the technological front yeah that might be true right and it's correct to say well let's use then more low-tech activities today because children are today already in the classroom children cannot wait for us five years or ten years in order to have the right technological ecosystem right the children are in the classroom today, right? And given that they are in the classroom today, then is that we need to provide the support to teachers and give them structured, uh, structured pedagogy so that they can uh, be more effective in, in the classroom. The support that the teacher in many low and middle income countries will need is very different than the support that a Finnish teacher uh, would have. Because I mean, as, as, as we, it was mentioned, in Finland, all teachers will have a master's degree. If we go to our low income countries, that's not the case. So hence the support the teachers will need is completely different, right? And they will need a different type of guidance in order to provide better support to their students in the short run. So we need to adapt to that. And many of those things can, that support can be given without technology. Maybe yes, we need to make sure that there is access to uh, internet, at least at the school level, that will help a lot, but not necessarily that all teachers or all students will need to have a a, a tablet or a, or, a, or or a laptop. So we we'll really need to be very creative and realistic in terms of that that combination between low tech and high tech. But also th always thinking that the key factor is the teacher. The key factor is that human factor. And 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 on that, I mean, some, something that um, um, Honorable uh, Lubangira was mentioning is extremely important first to adapt the solutions to the uh, uh, to the conditions of each country. So this rapid framework, as 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 it was asked, I mean, how can we adapt it? Those are those lines of action. I mean, are not being necessarily followed. Do not have to be followed exactly the same by all countries. I mean, this is a many of policies, and different countries will find will find what is most impactful and more effective in their own countries. However, this issue that um, that. Um, uh, Honorable um, Lubangira was mentioning that we need to assess learning and we need to know where we are is absolutely critical. Now let me let me close with two two thoughts and 
look, there's many, many technical issues that you have mentioned, and I'll be happy to have another occasion in order to go deeper in those in many in many technical um, uh, issues. But let me mention two two things. One is the impact that many of you have mentioned on equity. Uh, the huge challenge that we have in education is not that how to provide good education in one school. That we know how to do, and we generally we know how a good education or how a good school um, uh, works. That's not the challenge. The challenge is to make make sure that that good education happens in all schools and for all children, right? And when we talk about equality of opportunities, that doesn't mean that we'll need to say, spend the same amount of money in all children. Equality of opportunities makes it implies that we need to give the right service to all children, period. And that better service, that same service to all children might imply that for some children, we need to spend more. So it might be that for rural children, we need to spend more. For children with some type of disability or, or any type of handicap, we'll need to spend more. And so be it. So the same opportunity for everyone implies differences in how much money we need to invest in, it, in, it, in a child. So that has to be critical in, all, in, a, in, a, in our thinking. And my final thought is that we have been discussing here many technical issues, ECD, the issues of how to, the, the importance of mother tongue, right? To eliminate learning poverty, children have to be taught in their mom, in, in the language that they speak at home. That's, a, that's not a political issue. That is a technical issue. That's a pedagogical, pedagogical issue. So we thought many, many we've thought many, we spoke about many technical issues, but to solve them, we need to have two things. True, we need to have the right technical designs of all interventions, but that's not enough. We need to have the implementation capacity. Right? And that's a managerial, managerial um, capabilities in the education sector. It's not only about having the right pedagogical um, uh, instrument or the right pedagogical solutions. Those solutions have to be implemented at scale in all country, in all in the whole country. That's a management challenge. So it's not only about technical, the, the right technical pedagogical design, it's about implementation capacity. And to have that, we need to have the resources. It's a lot about domestic resources. International financial institutions can help. Yes, they can. They can leverage the implementation of certain reforms, but always, even in the low-income countries, the vast majority of resources are domestic resource mobilization. So in order to have the resources, in order to have the right technical design, in order to have the implementation capacity and to invest in the management capacity in the education sector, we need to have the political commitment. And on, well, with that, I close. Right? And the political commitment is something that you can drive your countries right? in making sure that you find the right social contract that makes sure that you put all those manage management and technical and financial resources in order to provide the resources that our children need. But a lot is about political commitment. So the work that you, that, that, that you can do in or your own countries is absolutely essential. And we're happy to, uh, you, you can see the World Bank as, a, as an ally Right in that in that uh, huge undertaking and in immense responsibility that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jaime, for answering those uh, questions from fellow MPs that uh, actually participated in the chat. I'd like to uh, apologize, however, to everybody. I did mention that all the panelists have a few seconds or a minute each to uh, convey a few final remarks. Unfortunately, I was told that there is no time for that and we are over time, actually. So we uh, are going to head over to the conclusion and the summary um, with the hopes that we can engage in more conversations uh, around this topic in the future. So the summary of uh, innovative actions and ideas from participating MPs, we had some from the chat column as well for the MPs that weren't able to uh, you know, present today. But these are the main points, which is increasing education department budgets, uh, ensuring funding cascades the grassroots level. This is also very important. Uh, greater parliamentarian engagement with education authorities. Uh, the next is training early 
childcare providers to improve foundational literacy and numeracy. And this was mentioned uh, before, I remember Honorable Asani mentioned this as well, uh, teaching children to be innovators and employers rather than employees. Uh, and, and the next is high speed broadband internet coverage across countries. We've heard, you know, from all our panelists actually mentioning how this, this access of uh, internet is very important. Tele uh, lessons broadcasted through TV channels and lastly, a global plan to accelerate educational pro uh, progress. I do hope that with your enthusiasm, as I can tell everyone here has, uh, is again, we can mobilize on the importance of uh, the, the access to education and how we can again, uh, you know, not only contribute to uh, future interventions, but also work together across countries, across nations, um, how we can really hone on each other's strengths. And um, lastly, I want to also encourage all MPs present to continue the discussion in your respective countries. Hopefully you can also mobilize with governments because understandably parliament um, has, you know, uh, is one side of the education. I think being able to form good partnerships with the government who are executors in this field is also very important and making sure that there's enough budget as well within the educational sector uh, for that to improve in the future. Uh, the parliamentary network has local chapters in some countries, but if this is not the case in your country, uh, please consider creating one to encourage regular communication between your parliament and the local World Bank office. Uh, the PN would be happy to guide you in doing so. And I think a final line to say is that I will be following up to ensure we have a vibrant chapter in Indonesia. And I do encourage all of you to also create your chapter. Thank you very much for your time, for your energy, for your um, commitment and um, also I'd like to thank the World Bank for hosting such a remarkable uh, event in, in connecting all of us together and hopefully we can work together in creating the future that we all want so thank you I'd like to end today's vibrant session with a thank you and I hope to see you again next time.